All right, well, great to be with you all again, Um, and uh, always a great joy to be in the Lord's house. Um, Let's uh, turn to the Lord in prayer one more time as we begin uh, uh, this message. Lord, how good and, and faithful you are, and Lord, we're reminded that uh, joy is the fruit of the Spirit, and you have put your Spirit in us, Lord, and upon us, that um, in you we may have joy, and that our joy may be full. And thank you for tastes of that now, Lord, and thank you for the fullness of that we will experience one day in your presence. And tonight, Lord, I ask for special help as I... Uh, broach this uh, heavy uh, topic and subject of um, abortion and unborn, preborn life. I pray that you would open our eyes and lay upon our hearts, Lord, what we can do and should do as your people to be a voice, Lord, for those who have none um, and to honor you and your word in all things. So help us now to hear in Christ's name. Amen. Have a Bible. Please turn to Psalm 139. If you were in Sunday school this morning, you got a foretaste of this. That's why you should come to Sunday school. But I'm talking to the Sunday night crowd, so you probably all know what I'm talking about already. But why, why talk about... Abortion. Why talk about the sanctity of human life? Well, today is the Sanctity of Life Sunday. But why speak about this topic at all? You know, it's, it's kind of controversial. Can't we just kind of brush over those kinds of things? But as it comes to this and many other issues, but especially this issue, the stakes are too high to ignore. Have you ever thought about the fact that the most important conversations that you ever have in life or should have are often the hardest. Sometimes we want to talk to people about their soul, their salvation, the most important thing we could talk to them about, and oftentimes those are the hardest conversations to have. Well, when it comes to abortion, of course, the stakes are high. If the pro-abortion or, or, or pro-choice, as they like to be called, are, are, is correct, then it's a human right. And that's what they argue, that it is a human right to be able to have an abortion. If the pro-life position is correct, then we have a modern-day holocaust on our hands. And, and that's not, and I'm not using hyperbole, I'm not exaggerating, an estimated 60 million Abortions, babies have been killed in the United States since Roe v. Wade was legalized in 1973. That's roughly 10 times the number of Jews killed in the Holocaust. That is, since 1973, enough people have been aborted to repopulate right now the entire states of California, New York, and New Mexico combined. Abortion is America's most frequently performed surgery on women. It is pushed indiscriminately by culture and even doctors and health organizations, despite the fact that it is linked to greatly increased risks of suicide, depression, infertility, and physical and mental handicap in future children. And most importantly, if God's word is right and true, then despite how modern we think we are and how righteous we feel that we are as modern Americans, then we have more blood on our hands as a nation than the entire death toll of World War II on every side combined. Cain shed the blood of his brother Abel. And God came to Cain and said, where's your brother? And Cain said, Am I my brother's keeper? Do I have to take care of my brothers? Are they my responsibility? And what did God say? 
the blood of your brother cries out from the ground and I can hear it. Yes, we must talk about abortion and the stakes are too high to ignore it. So if you have your Bible and if you're able and willing, would you please stand in honor of the reading of the word of God from Psalm chapter 139 and we'll begin in verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book, were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. If I awake, I am still with you. The word of God. You may be seated. There's a few things I want us to see from this passage, and the first thing is this is that God is the creator of unborn life. God is the creator of unborn life or preborn life. In verse 13, David talks to God. He says, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. David understood that when he was still in the womb, he was still David. And God still knew him. Indeed, knew him as David. The angel told Zechariah that uh, John the Baptist, uh, that he would be full of the spirit from his mother's womb. The giving of life is a divine act of God. We don't, we can't give life. God has the prerogative over life. He owns all life. He gives life and he takes away life. In Ezekiel 18.4, God says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. In other words, we don't have the right to destroy the life that God has created. God gives life inherent value. It says that, David says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The human body is perhaps one of the most incredible things that exists in the universe. It's it's unimaginably complex. And even the tiniest cell that composes one one cell of one organ that that, uh, is part of an entire incredible elaborate system that forms our whole bodies where we have sensors that we, which we perceive information with our eyes and we hear things with our ears and our brain is able to process those like a highly advanced computer. We're, uh, we're, at, the, we at, we're at the bare minimum, at the bare minimum, we are so incredibly highly advanced biological machines that it's unfathomable that we even exist. It's astounding. David says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. In Genesis 127, it says that, it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That is that human life, and I want to give a shout out to Pat Ward. He did such a great job this morning of explaining that text. But it's so true. God has, he he has created us in his image and we bear the, the image of God. And we have inherent dignity and value because we bear the divine image. And that image, God's word says, is inviolable. That is that we, unlike all other creation, we stand apart, we stand unique. No other uh, being was created in God's image. And, 
And we are, as it were, the crown of God's creation. We reflect God in a way that, that nothing, else, nothing else on earth does. And because we bear the divine image, human life is sacred. And we inherently, we inherently know this. No matter where you go across the world, in any culture, in any context, in some way, shape, or form, they understand the sacredness of human life. In Genesis 9, uh, verse 6, it says, Whoever shed the bloods of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. In other words, God understands that, that the, the image that uh, man bears is inviolable. That in, in other words, to violate the image of God in another person is to uh, deny your own self the right to bear that image. That's how sacred it is. And the Christian worldview is the only worldview, really, that provides a basis for the sanctity of human life. If evolution is true, and the functional principle of all biological life is survival of the fittest, then it doesn't make, then we, we can, we can, doesn't mean you can't affirm the sanctity of human life, but you have no basis for it. And we know that different times and different seasons in history, that teaching has been taken to its logical conclusion. Uh, It's undeniable, for example, that the Nazis were influenced by the teaching and in pursuit of of the perfect human, undefiled by lesser races, Well, what do you do? Well, you extinguish those who you consider the lesser race, like the Jews. Did you know that the first president of Planned Parenthood was Margaret Sanger, who took her evolutionist views to their logical conclusion and was a proponent of what's called eugenics? And what eugenics basically is, is it's basically population control. And the way that the abortion machine got started in America was not, by Margaret Sanger, was not a woman rights issue. It was a eugenics issue. She wanted to, well, let, let, me, let, me, read, let me read you this from Randy Alcorn's book, Why Pro-Life. This is what he says. Margaret Sanger spoke of the poor and handicapped as the, quote, sinister forces of the hordes of irresponsibility and imbecility claiming their existence constituted an, an, quote, attack upon the stocks of intelligence and racial health. She warned of, quote, indiscriminate breeding among the less fit that would bring into the world future voters who, quote, who may destroy our liberties and who may thus be the most far-reaching peril to the future of civilization. You don't see that on Planned Parenthood flyers. But that's how... The abortion machine in America got started. But God says that every human being is inherently valuable. Not because they're rich, not because they're poor, not because they're white, not because they're black, but because stamped on their soul is the divine image of God. God is the creator of unborn life and of every human life. And because of that, it's sacred and inviolable. Second, second, the unborn child is a person. The unborn child is a person. Again, verse 13, <clears throat> David, says, David says, My inward parts knitted me together in my mother's womb. The Bible understands that a child is a human being, Regardless of, regardless of where it is in its stage of development. Why is this important? Well, it's actually, it's, it's actually incredibly important. In fact, really the issue almost hangs on this one question. What constitutes a human being? Because not even the, mo- not even the most staunchest pro-abortion person is going to promote uh, the killing of, of 
of what they understand to be humans because that would be flat out murder. Well, actually, well, some of them probably do. But few people are going to come and promote murder as such. But if you understand, but if you want to, but if you want to maintain abortion for whatever reason that you may have to do that, but you don't want to promote murder as such, what do you have to do? You have to convince people that an unborn child is not a human. And when you do that, you've won. Because then you're not murdering a person, you are getting rid of some kind of mass or a parasite. And that's the story that's being told. There are common arguments to be used to deny the personhood of the unborn child. And I, well, I'll, let me talk briefly about a few. One is size. That is, because it's so small, because it's so little, and because, in fact, at times, or at early enough stages, it doesn't look human, therefore it must not be human. But let me ask you, is one's humanity determined by how big they are? Is, is my four-year-old more human than my four-month-old because he's bigger? Will we really say that someone's size determines their personhood? What about level of development? This is closely related. But think about it. When the baby is so small that they're what's called a zygote, a fertilized egg, it doesn't look like a person again. So people don't, lots of people, they don't think about it. They don't get too concerned with saying that's a person. But listen, most of you have seen the picture of an ultrasound. If I, I should have brought it. If I had an ultrasound of one of my sons and then I held up one of my sons, I would say, this is my son and this is my son and they're the same. How do I know that? Because if I would have got rid of this, there would be no this. They're the same. You can't say they're not the same. If you get rid of one, you lose the other. When my son was in Meg's womb and this big, that was my son. Because all of him was right there. And even no matter how small you shrink it to this small, can you imagine? That's my son. That was my son. He was there. All of him was there right there. Does level of development, are we willing to say that level of development determines personhood? Does a person with a severe autism less human than a person without severe autism? Is a person with Alzheimer or dementia less human than a person without it? No. We, we may look at a, the little zygote. And say that doesn't look like a human being, so it must not, it doesn't look like a baby, so it must not be a baby. Whoa, whoa. When you see a newborn, you say that looks like a newborn's supposed to look. And when you see an 18 year old, you say that's what an 18 year old's supposed to look like. Well, when you see a little fertilized egg, if we were thinking properly, we would say that's just what a little baby at that stage is supposed to look like. That's just what they're supposed to look like. That's what a little baby looks like when they're that. They're still a baby. Size, level of development. Another one, um, argument against personhood sometimes leveled is environment. This one's, I don't know how it's gained traction, but it has. The logic doesn't make sense when you think about it, and nevertheless it's, it's put forward. And that is that is argued essentially that if it's outside the womb, if it's a baby. If it's inside the womb, it's not. But does person, is personhood dependent on one's location? If I take something and change its location by literally a few inches, does it magically swap from un, unhuman, unhuman to human? And why is it, let us ask, why is it that the same act, that the same act when the baby is inside the womb can be called a legal abortion? And if that same act many times 
surgical abortions are performed when the baby is viable. And, and that same act outside the womb would be called infanticide and murder. Does one's location really determine personhood? And finally, degree of dependency. Some have gone, some say that because the child is totally dependent and on the mother for, for life and existence and sustenance, that therefore the woman has the right to abort that baby. But does degree of dependency on someone else determine personhood? If you have a newborn and you don't feed and take care of your newborn, what's going to happen? They're going to die. Why? Because they're so utterly dependent upon you that if you don't give your life to them, they're not going to make it. But there's no difference from the womb, in the womb, or outside of the womb. There's no difference. And is, it not, and is this not true? When there are persons who are... It, don't we have a greater responsibility, a greater moral responsibility to protect the most dependent and those who are the most helpless and the most weak and the most needy? Isn't our moral responsibility greater to protect those since they cannot speak for themselves and defend themselves? Aren't we supposed to, aren't we supposed to work harder to protect the weak instead of saying that because they are weak we can get rid of them? The Bible makes it clear that when David was in the womb, he was still David. One of the most, in my view, one of the most amazing things that ever happened on planet Earth. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. When, when did the word become flesh? At conception. When the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and she conceived by the Holy Spirit, God entered humanity. At conception. I think if we think carefully, the arguments to deny the personhood of the unborn do not hold. Therefore, from conception until death, human life is human life and it's sacred. Surprisingly, now if you, if you read the statistics, a surprising thing is happening in the past few years. Younger people coming up, more of them are actually opposed to abortion than have been in the past. And one of the reasons most likely that is happening is because of science and ultrasounds and 3D ultrasounds that we have showing people what babies look like. You know, it's been recorded at times of... There was... um. Uh, again, Randy Alcorn in his book, Why Pro-Life, gives an example of a time in some kind of journal where they actually advised uh, uh, like, uh, health care providers about women who, considering giving them abortion, they told them, don't show them the ultrasound. Because of how powerful it is. And consider some of the facts that happen from conception uh, uh, as a baby develops. At conception, when the sperm unites with the egg, we at that moment have a new human being. It has its own unique genetic code that could be tested by geneticists to have its own unique DNA. That genetic code at that point has sufficient information to govern the life and growth of that individual for the rest of its life. From five to nine days, 
old from conception. The baby implants on the uterine wall for nourishment and protection. At that same time, the gender of that child could already be uh, scientifically determined. At two weeks, 14 days, the baby releases hormones that suppresses the mother's menstrual cycle. At 18 days, 18 days, the heart is forming and eyes are developing. At 21 days, three weeks, before most women know they're pregnant, heart is pumping blood through the body. 28 days, four weeks, there are budding arms and legs. 30 days, the brain has developed. 35 days, mouth, ears, and nose are taking shape. At 40 days, less than six weeks, before most women know they're pregnant, brain waves can be detected. At 42 days, the skeleton is formed, and the brain is already controlling movement of the muscles and organs. This is, again, before most women ever know they're pregnant. Of course, surgical abortion that happens in the, in the hospital or abortion clinic, of course, will happen after the woman discovers she's pregnant. What does that mean? It means every surgical abortion that is performed stops a beating heart and stops already detectable brain waves. Every single one. Because it's already happened in the womb. Thus, the Bible attests and and science corroborates that from conception to death, from womb to the tomb, a human being is a human being. There's an old elephant named Horton. And Horton had a little flower, and on that flower he heard a who calling out to him, saying, save us, save us. Horton heard a who. And the lesson that Horton was trying to teach the rest of the animals is that a life is a life, no matter how small. And because unborn children are human beings, we have an obligation to help the helpless, defend the defenseless, and speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. God is the creator of preborn life. The preborn child is a person. And finally... God shows grace to the born and preborn alike. Verse 17. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I wake and I am still with you. What is David saying? David is reflecting on how in Incredibly amazing it is that the God of the universe who created the cosmos and who put the planets in motion and who sees him everywhere and no matter where David goes, God knows him and God sees him. And this great God who holds the world together, he thinks about you. And he thought about you when you were this big and he thought about you when you were this big. And David could not get over the fact that God was thinking about him. Now, we know something else about David, don't we? We don't know the exact order and times that these psalms were written. But we know something else about David. David was a murderer. David willfully chose to shed innocent blood. A man more righteous than he. But there's something else we know about David also. And that is that David, when he was confronted with his sin, and he, he saw himself in the mirror, and he said in Psalm 51, Oh God, have mercy on me. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. Purge me and I will be clean, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Hide your face from my sins, blot out my iniquity, create in me a clean heart. And renew a right spirit within me. What am I saying? I'm saying this. 
that if there's anyone in this room who has had an abortion, who has paid for an abortion, who has encouraged an abortion, who was silent when he should have spoken up out against an abortion, that the grace of God extends to you. God sees that little child. He sees that little child destroyed in the womb. Yes, he does. And he sees you too. He sees you from the inside out. And this is the, yes, it's the scandal of grace. And grace is a scandal. That God has the audacity to forgive. Yes, even the unforgivable. He has the audacity that by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, he he will forgive those who even think they cannot forgive themselves. That is the power, the scandal of the grace of God. God told Cain, he said, he said, your brother's blood cries out from the ground to me. What is it crying for? What was Abel's blood crying for? It's crying for justice. God, give me justice. But the author of Hebrews has something to say to us. He was telling his people like we talked about this morning, that there are two ways that the world has worked. There was Mount Sinai, the author of Hebrews says, and then there's Mount Zion. And Mount Sinai, if you remember, there was fire and smoke and thundering and angels and a voice that was so frightening that they begged Moses to talk to God so they wouldn't have to face God themselves. It was the fire of God's righteousness, the fire of God's law and God's God's judgment. But in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, he says, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, And to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What does that mean? Abel's blood cried out against Cain. Give me justice. Give me justice. Jesus Christ's blood cries out from the cross. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Jesus' blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Jesus' blood cries out not for judgment, but for mercy. And Jesus' innocent blood was shed on that day in Jerusalem to cover all the innocent blood slain in all the earth. So that if you repent of your sin and embrace Christ by faith, his blood will cover you too. And you can be sure beyond a shadow of a doubt. That he has washed you. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins were like scarlet, they will be whiter than snow. That's the scandal of God's grace. And so my invitation to you and to all is very simple. No matter what we've done, God's grace is enough. If we will cling to him by faith, all of us come to Christ undeserving. But we walk away righteous in him because of what he's done for us. And you can receive him and have all your sins and your guilt and your shame washed away through the blood of Jesus Christ.